Welcome to Versed, the ASCAP podcast. I'm Eric Philbrook. It's Women's History Month, and all month long, ASCAP has been celebrating our women music creators who are making history now. We continue our celebration with two very special guests in this episode. Coming up soon, I talk to Grammy Award winning engineer Ann Mincelli, who is a longtime collaborator with Alicia Keys and is a co founder of She Is the Music. But first, I have the pleasure of introducing ASCAP's very own Sarah Feingold, who talks to one of today's most exciting singer-songwriters, Maya, a.k.a. MXM Tune, a YouTuber who rose to fame when she self-released her 2018 debut EP, Plum Blossom, recorded on her laptop in a bedroom, and which today has been streamed over 100 million times. Maya, who has her own podcast, 365 Days with MXM Tune, recently released a great new song, Mona Lisa, which we are thrilled to feature as theme music for this season's podcast. She's a multi-talented artist who combines passionate, open-hearted songwriting with a keen grasp of the tools and platforms that today's music creators can harness to expand their audience, and she is set to launch a major North American tour starting in May. Now, here is Sarah Feingold and her wonderful conversation with MXM Tune. I'd love to start off talking about your new song, Mona Lisa. Um, one thing I really love about our podcast is that we get ASCAP members to record our theme music, and we had Adrian Young and Ali Shaheed Muhammad, and we had Sam Hollander, and now we've got MXM Tune. So I would love to talk about this song. I think it's such a fantastic song. It's very writerly. It's very candid. Um, I love music. Goals, to me, it feels almost like the I want number, like of the musical of your life. Um, and so it feels, and it also to me feels very grounded in the idea of transitions and movement. Um, and so I'd love to hear a bit more about your process of writing the song and why you chose the Mona Lisa as your reference point for the title. Absolutely. I think, you know, clearly we all know the Mona Lisa. I think if we ask the world who the Mona Lisa is, if you, they know of her, if they know of the painting, I'd say that, you know, nine out of 10 people probably could give you a yes. And I think I was thinking really frequently over the pandemic when I was kind of tossing around song ideas, the whole, this whole concept of, you know, artists always taking the time to write songs about people in their lives and making music about, you know, their experiences and the people that they love and the people that they know. And, you know, looking at the Mona Lisa, which is this world famous painting of a portrait of a woman who we actually don't know very much about, but is still one of the most famous people probably that has ever existed in known history. Um, and thinking about, you know, man, how nice would it be to be famous without having to share everything or make your own art? Like to have someone else paint a portrait of you and have that be kind of the fire that carries on in the world for you and your story. So I was thinking really heavily about it, especially coming off of my last uh, EP. I think I also had my last EP that I released was Dusk. And it was very much an EP that was about kind of my internal process, but also kind of looking back and reflecting on my first relationship that I had and was writing music about. And I think one thing coming off of that, I kind of was thinking, why did I spend the energy writing songs about somebody that I wasn't really actively thinking about or wanting to think about? And why can't I be the person that I'm writing songs about in kind of a romantic way? Like, wanting to be a Mona Lisa. And so that was kind of where it was born out of like, I wish someone would write a love song for me. Well, they probably won't do that. So maybe I'll just write a love song for myself. In the, so that way I can kind of tick that box and move on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really love the thought of a love song to oneself. And that's interesting because I feel like when I listen to your older stuff, I also, there were a lot of I statements that I sensed. It was, it felt very grounded in the, you know, the concept of oneself. So maybe it wasn't really about you, but just about someone as an I statement, if that makes sense. Definitely. I think, you know, a lot of my music is very introspective and very reflective. And I think, you know, I've taken a lot of time to make songs that feel very emotionally vulnerable. And I think Mona Lisa is emotionally vulnerable in a different way and kind of feeling like you are worthy enough to be a subject of art instead of just feeling worthy enough to talk about your emotions. It's, it's even more than that. It's about being able to put a spotlight on yourself and, and, you know, to maybe see yourself as like flawless or like at least, you know, not damaged goods or whatever it may be. I think like, you know, a lot of my music has been very kind of sad in its history. And Mona Lisa is a song that it is, I don't think it has any sadness to it at all. It's really just about being able to find yourself as beautiful and being able to portray that to the world around you. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. And I want to talk about now, it's loosely related, but 
I want to talk about your experience of you said that you were in Brooklyn um, and you moved to New York a few years ago, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and I want to talk to you about the experience, both for your identity and for your creative process of making that transition um, to New York, because it's a very, it's a very singular experience. It's very different. Some people find it isolating. Some people find it exhausting. Um, and I know that a lot of people say they experience um, creativity differently in this environment. And so I was wondering what your experience was like. I think it's very similar actually to the city I grew up living in originally, which is Oakland. So I think in a lot of ways it was, I was, it was a very natural transition to go from being in the Bay area to being in Brooklyn, New York. I think that the two kind of cities and around and people actually are very similar to each other. So in a lot of ways, I think I was prepared for the culture of the city that I was going into moving into Brooklyn in 2020. And, um, but I think it, it is very isolating. You're you're alone a lot of the time. You're on the subway by yourself. You're walking to go get your groceries. You're not interacting with people, I think, on the same level that people might expect when you're in a city full of millions of people. Um, but I think from a creative standpoint, the biggest impact has been a lot of time for self-reflection. I mean, in tandem with the pandemic too, I think I've just had a lot of time to sit and think with myself and listen to music that is inspiring to me and really take my time writing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if anything too, it's, it's really kind of opened up my perspective, especially this is my first city that I've ever lived in without my family. And I think, you know, it was a big step for me as somebody who has never, I'd never went to college. This was kind of my launching off point from my nest growing up. And, um, it's been a very big learning process for me. And I think just having the space to even discover myself as an individual outside of the context of my hometown has been a very big impact on me creatively and in my writing process for sure. Mm -hmm. And continuing to talk about your creativity and making that transition, um, but getting a little bit more granular, I'm curious if your creative process or your relationship to your creative process has changed over these past few years. Cause I think it, you know, the past five, maybe six years, you've achieved, you achieved a lot of success. You've achieved a lot of things. Um, and you've, you know, collaborated with a lot of exciting people. And I'm wondering um, how your relationship to writing has changed. I view it very much as a collaborative experience now instead of an individual one. And I think that's probably the biggest difference is just being in New York and being in a city where I think there is a presence of musicians and studio settings and sessions. And I, you know, in Oakland, there is that, but I wasn't necessarily working in R&B and hip hop, which is kind of what it is mostly in the music scene there. And so it was different coming to New York where I felt like there was an opportunity for me to work with different producers and different people and writers and everything. And I think writing for me now is something that I really look forward to the collaborative effort of sitting in a session and kind of working with another person on finding the right words and finding the idea that we want to make. And not to say that in the individual setting is not something that I'm interested in anymore. I still spend a lot of time sitting in my bedroom thinking about song ideas and everything. And I think, you know, being in such a personal space like your bedroom contributes to writing certain kinds of music, but New York feels so much more collaborative than any city that I've ever been in. And I think people are just so excited and happy to make music here in a way that I haven't encountered in, you know, Oakland or maybe even LA. I think it's just, it's been very um, productive for me as an individual, not only just like as a musician, but also as a person. I just, I feel like the connections I make with people here are a lot deeper and that translates into the kind of music that I get to make at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's funny because we talk about New York being isolating, but at the same time, it's also very vibrant totally and, and so alive so in a day you can think to yourself oh i'm feeling so lonely and i'm feeling so crummy and then later in the night you have a moment where you're like this is the new yorkiest moment of my life and i can't believe this is happening oh or totally have, yeah or you have like a breakthrough moment with a collaborator and you're like oh my god i can't believe i get to work with this person this is so mind-blowing um and i'm wondering if you have any examples of those Th those moments that are just oh like goodness. perfectly in their magic, whether it's about being in New York or creating, I I just love to hear if you have any stories the like that. those are the best. I love those. Totally. I mean, I think the first moment I really realized that I was like in New York and living in a different city was actually when Biden was elected as president. There was like, I had never experienced anything like that growing up because I mean, in Oakland, it's a big city, but it's like, you're still in a town, like you're spread out enough from people that you're not going to immediately see people walking down. But I mean, I live in Brooklyn and so there's so many people here. And the day that Biden got elected, everyone had opened up their windows 
and was banging on pots and pans, like going into the streets. And like, like from where I live, I can also see like a bunch of major protests and parades. And it just felt like, you know, in a city that does have a tendency to make you feel so isolated, there are so many instances of these beautiful moments where people come together and connect on these things that they feel utterly passionate about. And I think, you know, Oakland was very much like that. I grew up going to protests and, you know, going out there and interacting with my community and New York feels the same way, but it's so much larger. Like there are just so many people and seeing everybody come together for different causes. is just like, it's so mind blowing every single time. It'll never get old. <laughs> I'd like to pivot now to talk a little bit about women's history month because yeah. March is women's history month. And so I'd love to hear about some women in history who inspire you, who you like to think about, whose work you really vibe with. Yeah, so I actually grew up studying architecture in high school, and I think a lot of my female role models were actually in architecture rather than in music. Music was not something that I necessarily actively looked to as a place for kind of inspiration or anything. So one person that I really look up to, I think, in her kind of strength and her legacy that she's left behind is this architect named Zaha Hadid. And so she she's incredible. She has all these like incredibly famous buildings, but I think she was one of the first strong female voices that I saw in a creative field that was like a boss and was never apologetic for kind of her legacy and Mark and her ideas. And um, I don't view myself nearly as intense or as cool as she is, but she's definitely one of them. And I think I also look to a lot of role models in my own personal life and my family, my grandmother and my mom still remain some of my greatest inspirations. I think their lessons can apply to music in ways that, you know, probably people wouldn't even expect. And, um, but yeah, I've always been able to, I think, find inspiration and guidance from women in my life, even outside of music. That's kind of always been where I've originally found them. But of course, I look to my female peers and the music industry as big inspirations, but it's always been my grandma and my mom. <laughs> what does your current process look like as far as when you're creating in your day to day and what gets you really, really excited or daunted or nervous when you're waking up in the morning and you have something that you're ready to work on? Like what's, what's the thing that gets you up and gets you jazzed? Well, as an anxious person, everything makes me daunted and nervous, but I think everything also makes you excited in the same way. It's just like that anxiety you feel is just an indication of how much you care. And I think when I wake up in the morning, the things that really get me excited is the opportunity to create. Like I am, I know very little about myself in my 21 years of existence, but I know one thing for sure. And it's that I need to be creative in order to live, in order to feel fulfilled, in order to be happy. And um, my days that I look forward to the most are the days that I get to go into a studio and meet new people or work with people that I know and get to make songs and sit down. And even if it's like we get nothing done and we just talk for the first five hours and just catch up with each other, like that is so fulfilling to me as an individual. I think just building those connections with people and getting to hear their stories because, you know, I think if there's anything that I've learned in the music industry, it's that storytelling is one of the most powerful tools that you can gather and become good at. And, oh my gosh, these people that I work with are such good storytellers and getting to sit down with them and hear them talk about the things that they've gone through is so gratifying. I just like, it's like getting the best podcast every single day of my life. And um, so I look forward to those days. I think those are really fulfilling, but I mean, in my own creative process, like I still do a lot of the same things. I sit in my bed and I think of ideas and I write them down in my notes app. I just started a new journal where I can write things down and bring them in with me to sessions. But I mean, I don't know. I think in some ways everything's changed since I moved to New York, but in other ways it's not changed at all. I still look for the same core values of what I love to do and get to apply them to my life every day. Mm -hmm. Is there something that you've taken away from working with any person that you've worked with that you can remember consciously being like, wow, that's an incredible tool or that's an incredible way they do this. And then you've incorporated into your own process. I mean, besides rhyme zone, um, there are many things that I feel like I've learned. I think, um, I feel like I've advocated for myself a lot better in the last couple of years of being a musician. I mean, when you start, when you're 18 years old, I think there's a lot of uncertainty that you feel with your presence inside of rooms with people that are much older within you that have been working much longer than you. And, um, I had one session where I got to work with two other women and they have become some of my favorite collaborators, Rosie and Pom Pom. And they are both based in New York. And I just, I adore working with them because I think shout that out they- Rosie and Pom Pom. Shout out Rosie and Pom Pom. They are fantastic. Um, 
And I think that they've really cultivated an environment where I feel very safe as a writer and as, as a woman too. And I think, you know, one thing that I really learned from those sessions is that I deserve to be there and we all deserve to be in that room together to talk and create and collaborate with each other. And I think as women, sometimes in the music industry, we're meant to feel so isolated and alienated from kind of our presence and um, what we deserve as people and as creatives and as artists and as bosses. Um, but we deserve to be in those rooms. We are there for a reason. We have value. We bring stuff to the table and um, Rosie and Palm have definitely made me feel more confident in my ability as a writer by, you know, building me up when I come into a room with some lyric ideas and they're like, that's awesome. And I'm like, really? Are you sure? And they're like, yes, we're not kidding you. And I do the exact same thing for them. So it's, I think, you know, having those spaces where women can come together and support each other are really important. Um, and I've learned so much from those experiences. Mm -hmm. oh, beautiful. We, we stand our supportive queen. <laughs> Absolutely stand them to the moon and back. And that's wonderful that you have so many people who make you feel safe and valid. And that's great. I love hearing about that. Um, something else I'd love to ask you about, this is a bit of a pivot, but we were talking about storytelling and I love talking to creators about storytelling because it's so like, so deeply important to mm -hmm. the, the crux of it all and what makes it work. Um, and I think that you're somebody who really gets a lot of joy and um, enjoyment out of gaming. Right, you enjoyed playing video games, computer games, board games, um, and I'd love to talk to you about like what that what that gives to you creatively. Um, you know what you take away from that, how it can be a place of either like rest and reset for creativity or a place of creative inspiration. Yeah, so I adore video games. You're hundred percent right on that. I think if I've been playing video games longer than I've been playing music. Um, but I love video games as a reset and also as inspiration. I think, um, one thing that people overlook so often is how good of a vehicle video games are for storytelling. I mean, I had the wonderful opportunity to work with life is strange true colors on helping them kind of, I was the singing voice of their main character in their latest video game. And that is an entire story about story like it's a video game that you get to play through and choose your adventure but it also is a basically an interactive movie talking about relationships and empathy and like different people and feelings and everything in between and so I mean video games have always been kind of my way to both understand the world and connect with it I still every night get on to discord and I talk with my friends and we play video games together. And on my weekends, I find new indie games to play that help me understand different kinds of perspectives and stories because they're being told through the developers. Lens. And like, so I think from a personal lens, I very much view video games as kind of a way to um, see how stories can be told in different ways, because there's so many ways that you can be done. Um, and even from a music perspective, I listen to soundtracks from games all the time. Like those are some of my favorite games and favorite music moments that I've found. And um, yeah, so I'm just constantly playing video games and constantly watching movies, constantly watching TV <laughs> and drawing inspiration from every place in between. Mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes I feel like a black hole because I'm just like consuming, consuming. Oh, <laughs> no, my no. partner, my partner made the comment. He's like, I don't understand how you have all this time. And I was like, I don't, I just I don't make it happen. I just constantly am consuming things. Yes. <laughs> Video game scores are a whole new ballpark. If you, if but my favorite one of all time is Persona 5s. I actually use that as inspiration when I go into studio sessions. I'm like, this song, this song from this video game that I love, you should check it out. But yeah, find inspiration in crazy places. Here's a question. If you were a game runner, you were designing your own game, pitch me that game. Okay, so. I thought about this. Initially, I had a game pitch and then the game that I was thinking that I would make got made. So I have to play it. Yeah. But my game pitch was basically, what if you were a stray cat? What would it be like if you were walking around the city? Like, what could you do? What could you get up to? What shenanigans could you have? And then the game called Stray came out and I was like, well, my entire dream has just been simultaneously erased and came true. So <laughs> like, I can't be mad at it. I'm just happy that someone else had the same idea and now I don't need to execute it. <laughs> and finally, what have been a few things in the past few years creatively that you've seen or heard or played or 
any of that where you've been like, besides the Persona 5 soundtrack, of course, what are a few things that you've been like, oh my God, this is the blueprint. I love this so much. I I think about this all the time. The probably one of the best things that I've found, I really love musicals. I also am a big musical fan. And so one of, I don't actually listen to new releases very often. I actually just listen to soundtracks of things, whether it's like video games or musicals or like, I literally listen to podcasts and I listen to their theme songs and I'm like, wow, this theme song is really good. <laughs> so like, I think one of the best parts of what I've been re-looking at is like, um, Mama Mia has been very pivotal in my kind of brain space over the last two years, because it was such a comfort for me. I think it was one of the Mama Mia and Hairspray were like the only two DVD or CDs that I owned when I was a little kid. And so the music on ba- both musicals have was very like influential to me and kind of letting me learn lyricism and understanding storytelling through the lens of like choruses and verses and whatever it is. So I love musicals. I think Mamma Mia has been like the biggest inspiration (laughs) for the last two years and also just comfort overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm glad that you mentioned that how much you love musicals at the end of the interview so that we don't have time for me to talk you off the canal. (laughs) That's really the reason I live. Like I love it so much. I don't care if it's corny. I don't care about anything. It's just cornier, the better. I, I truly love it so much. And, um, anybody who knows me knows this about me (laughs) because I'm such a, like a musical obsessed person. It's like, for me, like I also can throw on Mamma Mia and it's like eating, you know, a hundred of the most delicious cookies I've ever eaten in my life and not getting a bellyache, you know, it's just yum, yum, yum. I feel good. I feel great. ABBA invented pop music. It's like, exactly. (laughs) them everything, but Um, it's when I listen to your music, I hear the appreciation of musicals because there's such a musical theater writing has such a, like, it's such a specific relationship to story and a specific set of conventions that I feel like, yeah, that I feel like people really, when they get it down, they can use it in really interesting ways through their music. Totally. Yeah big musical fan, big like format of musical theater writing. Like, I just think that they, it's such a perfect way to understand motif and like understanding the importance of like theme and how it carries through in a project. Like it's, they do really well. My favorite one recently, I mean, he never misses. Encanto was my favorite animated movie that I saw recently. And I have been listening to that soundtrack and that soundtrack only for the last two months. (laughs) And everybody else, it's the, it's the talk of the world. It is. It is. I am a normie and I'm not afraid to admit it. <laughs> we don't have to be, you know, ashamed for liking stuff that's nice and good. Not at all. And besides Encanto, any other musicals in the past few years that have been like, oh I'm sorry, goodness. I can't ask this question. No. Well, I just that. went and I watched Hamilton on Broadway and my partner had never seen it. I had seen it at the Orpheum in San Francisco in 2017 and I was blown away. I had no expectations when I walked in on that first show, but I've been obsessed with Hamilton ever since I saw it. So it was so, I also had like really amazing seats. I was living. I was, I had such a fun time, but that was the most recent memory of musical that I have for you. (laughs) Yeah. I can tell you're a Lynn head. I love it. (laughs) Well, Maya, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, you're a legend, and so are your cats. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. This is a lot of fun. Ann Mincelli is a two-time Grammy Award-winning engineer and mixer who is a longtime collaborator and album project manager for Alicia Keys. She has worked with some of music's biggest acts, including ASCAP members Mariah Carey and Jay-Z. Along with Alicia Keys, Anne is owner of New York City's Jungle City Studios, which is known to be one of the most elegant and best-equipped recording facilities in the world. The versatility of Mincelli's talents seamlessly bridge both the creative and business sides of music. She's a leader and a co-finder of She Is The Music, an organization powered by creators, publishers, record labels, talent agencies, and more, with the goal of creating change and building an equal future for women in music. Now, here's my conversation with Ann Mincelli. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you're one of my favorite kinds of humans, a born and bred New Yorker. Yes. Um, you know, New York is such a music center. Um, um, you can't help but be a music lover growing up in New York. Um, but when did music move from a, a passion into a real purpose in your life? I think, you know, when I started out young at home, uh, a lot of my family members were just really into music. And I remember really loving music at a young age. My sisters had vinyl, they were older, and they would 
I would, you know, sneak and play their vinyl or I would go to my cousin's house and I started to really love music, you know, and really understand it at a at a young age and start to know what songs I liked and what songs really I didn't like. And I love the fact that back then you played a whole record, right? So like I experienced lots of old records from Roy Orbison to Diana Ross and the Supremes and, you know, Barbra Streisand was big and the Beatles and John Lennon for sure. Right. And so, you know, I think when you're when you're younger, you, you, you really focus on the artist and and there are so many other uh, people that go into uh, recording and writing music. Um, when did you first start really kind of digging down into like the people that made these records sound the way they did and, and who wrote the songs? Uh, was that something that you sort of like uh, really got interested in? Yeah, when I was 13 years old, I started to play guitar. And I started to collect, right, um, cassettes and CDs at the time, and and, and vinyl even back then. Um, and I used to read the credits. I was like, what is a guitar player's credit? What is that? How does that translate to a record? And I would start to read the credits, and I started to become like fascinated with the credits. I would memorize what studios were where around the world and make notes of what were the bigger studios that I seen over and over and the producers and the engineers and the writers and the studio staff that was all listed on each song. It, it amused me and it, um, I started to play guitar and started to play in a band. Uh, my friend did some session work. He was a guitarist. And I went to the studio a few times at a very young age, at the age of 15 and 16 years old, and it exposed me immediately to connect the dots. Like, hey, I'm this guitar player. We all play in a band or we try to, you know, go to rehearsals and learn and play. And I went to a musical high school um, in Staten Island and actually Method Man and Inspector Deck were actually in my class back in the day. Um, but. Um, and then I started to connect the dots. When I went to that studio and I just got to hang around three or four times, I started to answer questions. And those credits that I saw on the back of a vinyl or on the back of a CD, I was connecting the dots. Wow, I'm at Marathon Studios. Wow, I'm at Skyline Studios. You know, I'm looking at the guitar player that was on the credit that I saw and I started to figure out the roles. And it was then at a very young age that I said, there's so many careers that the studio is the hub. It's where the A&Rs come, the producers come, the managers come, the writers come. So I started to realize at a very young age that like, I could be part of this industry, you know? And like back then we all interned, you know, for free, you know, we started back in the day, there was no rules like there is today. And um, I started to intern for free as I got older, like during the summer, during school, you know, and I started to learn every aspect, whether I was answering the phones, which helped me learn how to communicate. And there's a lot of education and a lot of things you could learn in the studio, not just the technical things, but how to interface with artists, how to be a concierge and sort of keep them comfortable and get them all the things they need, whether you're running out to get throat coat tea or you're running out to get some type of organic honey, you under you start to really understand and understand all, all the roles like um, tape librarian, assistant day tech who followed the techs around and helped, you know, do all the alignments and all the text settings before the session started. You know, and that's how I got in the industry. I started interning for free at two studios, Marathon and Skyline, and worked my way up through then through there and wound up getting a paid position at Skyline, but it was sort of closing for like two years. They kept saying they were gonna close. And I was at Right Track recording at the same time. Mm -hmm. I would sleep on a couch and it was the best experience I ever had to be in two of the biggest studios in the world. like carrying a backpack full of clothes and being able to just really learn and hone in on my skills, whether it was the small things I was learning, like how to write up a message properly, you know, that tells you what type of assistant you were going to be and what type of engineer you were going to be, because it's the same thing as writing a recall of a vocal chain that the artist is using. So the next time they come in and they need to cut vocals, we could look at that 
and tell what mics they used and match the tone. So it all worked together. And really, that's how I got my start, you know, and there was so many studios at the time in New York, but it was fierce c competition as well. Yeah. There were a lot more studios. There were a lot more people trying to get in the door. And that's really how I uh, how I started, you know. Wow. Sounds like uh, an amazing ride. Um, so at what point did you did your life intersect with uh, Alicia Keys life? And, and how did that whole uh, relationship begin? I met Alicia at Quad Studios, um, just ran into her in the elevator. And at the time, she was signed to Columbia Records, which is under the Sony umbrella. And um, she was working on, she was young, maybe like 16 or 17. And she was one of the younger artists on the label along with Beyonce, right? Like they were the artists that were on the back burner while the artists like Celine Dion and Mariah Carey and Gloria Stefan and Billy Joel, they were all seeing all the dollars be pumped into them. And you had these younger artists that were the next wave and the next future. And it was cool, Columbia would take them on bus like like they had all their artists and they would develop their artists and that was a cool thing to see and alicia was one of those artists at the time and she was writing for a lot of um she had a pub deal at the age of 13 so she would constantly write she got placements on um like men in black soundtrack at a young age and a few other uh, muhammad ali soundtrack like a few things like they would place her songs and she was constantly just writing at the same time she was also making her first record which we know now is as songs in a minor but there was a lot of twists and turns from the columbia days going to arista then traveling with clive as he started his new label j record so that's how i met her was 1998 and just at quad studios where she had one of the little writing rooms on the um, 12th floor at the time. And we just kept building and work, figuring out ways to work with each other until she could take me on, you know, full time. But in the meantime, she worked at Quad a lot. She kind of liked it there. It was, a, you know, a reasonable rate and the rooms worked. And the owner, Lou Gonzalez, at the time, he um, reinvested so much money back into the rooms that we were getting a lot of great artists, but we had a lot of up and coming artists. And that was the beauty of it where you can mix and mingle them together. And that's really the first time I, I met her. Alicia just released a, a new album. Um, as someone who has worked so closely with her, um, this was sort of a different sort of uh, 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 project for her and for you. What yeah. What was uh, what was it like working on this double album that had two different total total feels to it? Yeah, so I think the goal was she wanted to do this piano vocal only type of record. So we knew that we wanted to hit the masses as well. You know, strategies are really important these days. DSP strategies and social media strategies and partners and content. How do you convert your social media followers to customers? You study all that market re research, right? And we went to Alicia and said, look, you can do this album a piano and vocal, but it'll probably appeal only to your super fans. Let's try and do, let's try and do rework the songs and do two versions of each song, you know? So that's, we brought Mike Will in and it was really unique because not many artists could really do that. And we really reworked each song. She might do two different vocal the you know vocals for the two different versions and there's some different parts in each version of keyboards and mike's drums are in one version and her version is completely you know stripped down and it's pretty impressive she produced her whole version on her own wrote produced wrote with some incredible writers but it's really nice to see someone of her stature get those credits sort of like the female version of prince there's not many artists that are out there producing and writing these days and playing and you know she programs her mpc she gets really in the weeds on the technical side of things and it's nice to see an artist know all of that you know so so this is women's history month um you've been part of uh, uh an organization that has really uh been one of the most uh impactful and sort of uh um 
I guess, you know, important sort of trends in the music industry, and that is She Is The Music, um, your co-founder. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's really a movement intended to empower female creators in the industry. Um, tell me a little bit about the origin of She Is The Music and what impact you feel it has made since launching a few years ago. Yeah, so we launched in 2018. A quick run through of the launch was um, somehow a Neil Portnow comment after the 2018 Grammys sparked this whole analytics and study on there's no women in the music industry. And it's like, okay, how do we fix that? How do we find the solution? And where can women go to? So we did some panels and the, the overwhelming response in these panels were, we need help networking. We need help getting in the rooms. Like we need help getting to the A&Rs. We need help getting to the, the producers that may need writers. So we formed an organization and myself, Alicia, Jody Gerson, with, who is the chairwoman of, of uh, Universal Music Group Publishing and Sam Kirby, um, who at the time was with William Morris. I think now she's at United. We formed um, She Is The Music and we had everyone who wanted to be involved involved. We have an executive committee, a creator committee. We have chapters per state. We have even a Latin um, division and we made pillars. So there's three pillars. It's songwriting, it's a database and it's um, mentorship. The mentorship program is incredible. We have um, uh, Susan Dotis, who um, was into music for the longest time, who now works at NYU, um, draw up the curriculum. And then uh, Cynthia Sexton, who's with Universal as well, they put together an incredible mentorship program that gets a lot of the folks on the creator and executive committee involved and it's not just songwriters producers and engineers it's females studying marketing females wanting to get in management females wanting to get in legal and touring we've expanded it and the database is the same thing you could go and filter and see what type of area of the music industry you know you might maybe you need a photographer for tour and a lot of the women have um we open the database up for everyone and we vet it a little bit, but you have your opportunity to see people's discography and resumes and it's pretty incredible. And then the writing camps, which is we populate them with one bigger artist and some of them are very community based where we're giving people opportunity in the community that would never be able to be in a room in a studio. Right now we're doing a camp, a four day camp. Uh, it's something very exciting we're working on with Katie Couric. And um, it's very exciting. We're doing it at Conway in LA and we curated it to bring certain artists and writers and producers together. It's our women of color camp to get more women of color involved and really help engage and help the next generation get from point A to point B, you know? And, and that's the goal. We're all about doing the work. We think there's a lot of organizations out there now, but we're about doing the work first. We promote it, but we also stand behind what we promote, which is really exciting. That is that's wonderful. Thank you so much for all the work that you've done on that front. Um, what advice do you give to young women who are starting out? I mean, you blaze your own trail in this industry. Um, what advice do you give to, to young women who, who really want to kind of carve their own path? I would say, you know, go for your dreams. There's nothing or no one stopping you. You know, I always worked hard. I was always very competitive myself. I played sports and I always studied really hard. I studied the Sonics, what records I loved. And, and at the same time, I learned the gear and all of the stuff I needed to learn to really want to be the best assistant. At Quad, we had 13 assistants. At Access Studios, we had five assistants. So I always wanted to be competitive and you know, be requested. And if you work hard, you're going to get the respect. You're going to get the notoriety. Nothing else will really matter. I know it becomes the numbers off and it feels uncomfortable, but get yourselves in those rooms. You know, a lot of people work from home, but you got to get yourself in a studio or with a production team or a producer that you can network 
and you're able to learn and learn on the level that you need to learn to 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 be that producer or that writer or that A&R folk person that you want to be. So for me, it's all about the work. You know, I follow a lot of sports teams and sports stars and um, it's about repetitive work. It's the same thing. It's not glamorous. There's lots of long hours, you know, no matter what it is in the music industry. I think there's not many nine to fivers anymore, you know, especially with the pandemic, you know, people are working from home. We're doing Zoom meetings uh, all night long and, you know, um, just work hard. You know, you have to have thick skin, you know, um, find what you really love and really want to do in the industry and go for it. There's YouTube, there's online classes. There's so much more that you can learn from. Back then when I started, I was 16 years old in 1990 and i had to read a book read a manual now with all the videos you get some really good insights and style you know certain styles there's no right or wrong you know i look at even myself people melodyne or use a plugin there's 10 different ways to use the same plugin and you, you have a lot of tools available right. so i would say you know just work hard and if you're find your passion and just work hard and be competitive and try to be better than the next person and you're going to shine. There's not much competition if you do that. That's great. Good advice. Um, just a couple more questions. Sure. What woman in history has inspired your career in music? I love, man, if I had one person that I can look at and say, wow, I'd have to say Carol King um, because she wrote songs since she's 16 years old and produced and wrote so many songs for so many other artists that we don't even realize is her song. But I love the sonic. When you listen to her records, just the sonic of her her records, I often refer to a lot because I'm working with a piano and, and vocalist right. as well. And we dive in a lot of the old concepts. I'm a huge gear collector. So I love, love, love Carol King. I love Oprah. She's an inspiration to me. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to keep building the studios all around the world that I'm building. And I am. I'm working with Rob Stringer at Sony on some really incredible, we built five studios for the Sony Studio Initiative. So Oprah is a big one for me because I learned that you can be a part of every aspect of our entertainment industry as a whole. There's, with the technologies today, it puts an up and coming person. I'm using the same gear as my neighbor who's 16 years old who asked for uh, Ableton drum machine for Christmas. You know, there's right. no divide where years ago we had tape machines, 100 input desks. We're using some of the same gear. And I feel like Oprah has evolved through the twists and turns of all of the entertainment industry. So she's a, I'm a big fan of Oprah. I love Sonically. I've studied every album of the Pointer Sisters due to not only their music and how incredible it evolved, but the musicians and the producers she used, like Richard Perry, or they use like Richard Perry or the guitar players or the drummers like Gaylord Birch, who was from the 60s and 70s. Right. So I love the Pointer Sisters and their sound and their harmonies and that they were the, they broke ground. They were the first females to win a, a country uh, first black women to win a country uh, Grammy, That's you know, amazing. and they performed in Nashville and Elvis um, sang their song. So they're another one that really forced change. They're another group that forced change and broke boundaries. So I studied them hardcore, loved everything about their sound and their musicians and you know, they're using Wawa Watson and all these players. And that's who the folks that we hired today. I've used Wawa. He was a good friend of ours. So, you know, those are the folks that influenced me and inspired me either on the business side or on the production side, you know. Wonderful. Um, are, are there any women in your own personal life that has helped shape, you know, who your identity or, or how you perceive yourself? Yeah, definitely. I have an older sister. Um, who is 13 years older, who is more or less, you know, my mom was my mom, but my mom was my best friend, but 
my sister is the one still till today. She's a partner in Jungle. She was the one that really pushed me. Like, why don't you have your own studio? Like, what are you thinking? And the first thing I thought was, oh my God, like that's such a huge, you know, undertaking. But, you know, she was the one that gave me that push and got it all started by finding the real estate. So definitely. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Anne. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been really cool to talk to you. I talked to a lot of songwriters and composers, and um, I was really looking forward to uh, to to meeting you and talking to you. Um, so uh, much appreciated. Thank you for having me. The ASCAP Experience is back for another year of inspiring and educational conversations with some of today's top music creators and industry experts. Our first session, in honor of International Women's Day, featured a conversation with a trio of world-class women in music, including 2022 Oscar-nominated film composer Jermaine Franco, Pulitzer Prize-winning composer Tanya Leone, and mega-hit songwriter Amy Wadge. You can watch it on demand in RSVP for future sessions at ASCAPExperience.com. So, go check it out. Thanks to everyone who made this episode possible, especially our special guests, MXM Tune and Ann Mincelli. Shoutouts to Sarah Feingold and Aton Rosenblum for interviewing and editorial support, Tiffany Sims for graphic design, Kate Cordova for social media magic, MXM Tune, Rosaline Cher, and Kellen Pomeranz for our uplifting new theme music, and Benjamin Keynes of Sightsense Productions for audio and video editing.